I, I, and just, I think we're going to get started and we'll let other people join as they do. Uh, I am thrilled today uh, to be able to introduce our speaker, uh, Danny Almaral from the University of Michigan. I'll introduce him a little bit more uh, thoroughly in just a second, but for those of you that have joined us, uh, a welcome to the Implementation Science Working Group. Uh, and uh, on behalf of uh, the entire team, of whom there are many here, uh, we are thrilled that you're with us for our second to last uh, session of the year. Uh, the last session of the year uh, will be a uh, time for us to get together in person, uh, which will be at, uh, hosted in the courtyard of the School of Public Health. Uh, Karen and Becca will be coordinating for us, and so we'll send details uh, at our usual appointed uh, third or fourth Tuesday of the month or whatever we're doing here, third, third I think. Um, and uh, and so today, as the last sort of substantive speaker of the year, um, Danny has agreed uh, to join us. So Danny's a statistician, uh, and he is the co-director of the Data Science for Dynamic Intervention Decision Making Center at the University of Michigan. He's an expert in many things, but the things that I have seen him speak speak about and have learned from him uh, and have cited him uh, deal in the world of adaptive interventions and uh, the use of the term Jedi's just in time adaptive interventions, multi uh, 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 MRTs as in a type of randomized control trial. But today we're going to talk what we asked him to speak about are smart designs. And I think what he's going to give us is a slight generalization of a smart design, which in the spirit of these uh, these wonderful acronyms, they have termed Maisie's. And so uh, Danny is uh, well known to many people in the Harvard community. He is a longtime collaborator and was a doctoral student of Susan Murphy. Uh, and uh, and we're thrilled that he can join us today. So we've asked Danny to speak for 35, 40 minutes. As you'll see, he is super energetic. Uh, and and then we'll take the rest of the time to uh, to to pepper him with questions and ask for feedback and and provide comments. So Danny, over to you. That's great. Thanks so much for inviting me, Natish. So can you all see my slides okay, or do I need to do a swap over here? Perfect. They're perfect. All set. All right. I'm going to get right to it, although I do want to say that, um, yes, my um, my most beloved colleague, collaborator, mentor, advisor, Susan, is now with you guys, and that's terrific. And uh, basically, anything good that I've ever said or done is because she taught it to me, so... Um, I adore, I adore Susan. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about, <clears throat> you guys asked me to talk about smarts, but my title does not have the word smart in it. You'll see why in a second. Uh, um, I'm, I'm talking about something called Maisie's uh, because you guys are an implementation science group, and this is one of my latest innovations. And um, the smart, which I'll get to much later about in about 15 minutes, is a particular trial design that you would use to create a good Maisie. So let's get right to it, okay? So um, let's see if I can... Okay, so here's what I hope happens. I hope you learn about the need for multi-level, multi-component implementation strategies. I hope you learn about Maisies as one solution. I don't. I'm, it's not the solution. It's just one way to look at things. And then... This is the part that I'm not going to finish, but that's okay. All right. I'm going to start marching through a bunch of different scientific questions concerning the optimization of a Maisie. And it's in that section that you're going to learn about smarts. Okay. All right. So let's get right to it. Oh, and I love getting interrupted. I'd rather if we start the discussion early and we don't even get through the slides, all the merrier. Okay. The only thing is I probably can't keep up with the chat, okay? So I just jump in. Okay, so there's a few slides here that none of you need me to share, which is all of us know implementation requires action at multiple levels, right? So the classic is like the system, the clinic, the clinicians, and then down there you have the patients, right? And, and a level is nothing more than a nested collection of recipients, okay? All right, all of you guys know that. All of you guys also know there's barriers to implementation at all of these levels. I don't need to tell you this. So at the clinician level, I might have lack of familiarity with some new evidence-based interventions. Um, at the clinic level, we may not even have an efficient workflow 
that would enable a new evidence-based practice to take hold. And at the system level, we might have ineffective communication or monitoring practices or policies, what have you. And then finally, all of you already know that, you know, Byron Powell and Nola and everyone else and the whole gang and all of you have been working diligently to create a bunch of implementation strategies that address these barriers at many of these different levels. Okay, so those are like the warm-up slides. I didn't really need to go there, but, but now here's the fun part. I want every single one of you to take off your researcher hat. I know that's really hard to do, right? Because you guys are at Harvard, okay? That's hard. But take off your researcher hat and put on your implementation support professional hat. All right, now you might be wondering what in the world is an implementation support professional? The best way for me to describe it is just as we have clinicians, you know, that treat patients, I believe that there's a world of implementation support professionals that are gonna be doing the implementation strategies on organizations. So, and notice, I am purposefully thinking of this person or professional as not a researcher. And you can see why, right? Uh, we get into a lot of trouble when we stick the researchers in the way. So, so now, now that you guys are implementation support professionals, I'll tell you when you can be a researcher again. Uh, life looks really tricky, right? So if I if I land at you know Dana Farber Cancer Hospital or whatever, and I'm trying to implement something in these clinics, oh my goodness, I have all these hundreds of implementation strategies, right? I have all these levels, you know, and I just arrived at the doorstep. Wow, I don't know which strategy to use for which clinic or which clinician or which part of the system. And so I argue that things look tricky. So all these little post-its are like different strategies. Everybody with me? Okay, all right. And the bottom line in my mind is that all of this trickiness comes down to something to heterogeneity. So let me define what that is because it means a million things to a different million people. What works for one target? Now, what's a target? A target is any one unit at any one of these levels, right? So if I'm thinking of the clinic level, a target is one of the clinics. If I'm thinking of the clinician level, a target is one of the clinicians, okay? So what works for one target may not work for another. That's between target heterogeneity. What's most interesting, all right, is that what works in the short run may not work in the long run for one target or vice versa. That's within target heterogeneity. And what's super cool about all this is that this heterogeneity is happening at all the levels, right? Stick in, you can stick in the word system for target. You can stick in the word clinic. You can stick in the word clinician. So this is why it's so tricky for the implementation support profession. All right, that's the first part of the talk. All right, so now what I wanna propose is MAZIs or multi-level adaptive implementation strategies. And by the way, you are still an implementation support professional until I tell you you're not, okay? All right, so, um, be, and so MAZIs, which I'm about to talk about, are one of the things we can develop as scientists, which you're not yet, to help the work of an implementation support professional. So let's let's skip all the all these words and go right to the picture. All right, you guys ready? All right. Um, for better or worse, my ex my primary example here, my motivating example, takes place in schools, not clinics. But I please bear with me, okay? And so what's happening here is, in the great state of Michigan where I live. Every high school already has in place a school professional that is responsible for all of the mental health and substance use services. Everybody with me? Okay. That's already in place at every school. So go Michigan, right? The problem is that the last time they did a survey, you know, the policy researchers that were looking to see what exactly are the school professionals doing to help the kids with mental health and substance use? Well, it turns out that a very, very tiny percent, like single digits of the activities they use are evidence-based, okay? Um, that surprised me, 
Okay. And what is most concerning is that I don't know if you guys realize this. You, some of you might have psychiatry department colleagues. In the United States, the majority of mental health and substance use services delivered to kids intersect with the school in some way. That is, if they're not delivered at the school, the school professionals are connecting the families to the clinicians. So, and so when you put that together with the fact that a lot of the stuff being done in schools in Michigan, I don't know, Massachusetts is always ahead of the game, right? Um, Massachusetts and California are always ahead of the game, but in Michigan, at least, we have quite a bit of implementation to do. So what we wanted to do in this Maisie is to give the implementation support professionals a, a strategy to help them implement CBT. So let me walk you through this. This is the longest part of the talk is me going through this, but it's the most important part because if I do it successfully, you will know what a Maisie is. You guys ready? So this is an example, Maisie. Let's go through it. It starts off at week zero, which happens to be in the summer. And you see the green here, district level. That's because we went to every single county in the state of Michigan, even as far north as like the Upper Peninsula near Lake Superior. And it, at that county level, we invited all the school professionals to like your local Holiday Inn. You know what I mean? And we did something called rep. All right. Now, down here, you're going to see two dollar signs. All right. Because I'm going to be walking you through a bunch of implementation strategies that differ in terms of their cost. That'll become important later. So what is rep? Rep itself had five pieces. OK, number one, we tried training them on Saturday and Sunday as best as we could in CBT. Who are them? The school professionals at all these high school. And remember, Every high school in Michigan has between one and four school professionals. You got it, Natish? Okay. The second thing we did in rep is we gave them access to a website. By the way, the we here is the implementation support professional, not the researcher. Okay. And so this was a nonprofit delivering these strategies. Okay. It's a local Michigan nonprofit. Okay. The third thing is we onboarded them to a newsletter to keep them engaged and in the implementation of CBT, as well as number four, a monitoring protocol and engagement strategy. So what is that? Well, the implementation support professional needs to keep track of how these school professionals are doing on their journey to implement CBT. So they onboarded them to the monitoring protocol, much like a clinician might onboard you to some dashboard to see how your depression is doing over the next few clinic visits, okay? And then finally, at that Holiday Inn, as they were walking out the door, we gave them a technical assistance phone number. We patted them on the back and we said, hey, if you get stuck trying to do CBT, call me. Okay? Call me the implementation support professional. Everybody with me? All right. So this is $2 signs. Okay? At week 12, and this is now into the school year. Okay, like this is probably a couple of weeks into the school year or no, maybe like a month or two into the school year. We were able to identify schools as startup schools or not. And imagine a Maisie in which startup schools get coaching and schools that are not startup schools just stay the course on rep. Remember, rep included that technical assistance number, which they can just call me whenever they want. Okay, you guys with me? So what is coaching? Oh, well, what is a startup school? A startup school is a school profession is a school with professionals who have not yet delivered any CBT. Despite doing this training at the Holiday Inn, <laughs> you know, they went back to their schools and they haven't yet delivered any CBT. All right. Okay. So what is coaching? Now you see coaching is $4 signs. This is incredibly expensive. And the way we operationalized it here is massively expensive because it was in person. Believe it or not, we had a coach drive out even as far north as like 10 hours away in the Upper Peninsula and sit with the coach for extended periods of time, sit with the school professionals, coach them, watch them do CBT, give them feedback and you know rinse and repeat. That's $4 signs. That's expensive. But of course, we only did it in this pretend Maisie for the startup schools. Everybody with me? Okay. At week 21, now we're well into the school year. I think week 21 might be after the holiday break. 
we now categorize the schools as responding schools or slow responding schools, okay? And you can be a responding or slow responding schools whether or not you got coach, okay? So all the schools are classified as either responding or not responding. And here's the definition below. You're slow responding if any one of the two is true. The SPs have not provided a super low bar of CBT, okay? Details are down below. Or... The SPs might be providing a massive amount of CBT, but they're reporting barriers, significant barriers, more than two, to providing CBT delivery, okay? So if, e if you endorse either one or both of these, you're considered a slower responding school. And what we did is we then offered the slow responding school facilitation. So if you didn't get coaching, you got facilitation and rep. If you did get coaching, you continue getting coaching, and rep, and you add on facilitation. Everybody with me? Julie, you have a question? Are you good? You're good? All right. So facilitation is only $3 signs because it's not as expensive as coaching, but it is a more expensive than rep, and it's done over the phone. Do you guys remember that technical assistance number we gave them as part of rep? Well, they would essentially, if they had called us, they would be calling this facilitator. The difference is that when we do facilitation, we are proactively calling them, not them calling us, which I bet you, you guys already know the answer to this question. How often do you think they called us? Not very much, okay? And that's why it's a $1 sign intervention when you give somebody a phone number, you know? It just makes you feel good, but they're not gonna call you. So facilitation is a weekly phone call and it's by a facilitator whose focus is on what I call business, the business, business level uh, coaching tactics. So whereas the coach is a CBT skills coach, the facilitator is helping these school professionals navigate other non-skill based barriers. For example, believe it or not, in our wonderful great state of Michigan, some of the principals wouldn't give the school professionals a room to do group CBT. Can you can you believe that? <laughs> so so the facilitator is actually helping them navigate these these barriers. How do you talk to your principal to get buy in? You know, and so on and so forth. Okay, it's incredible, but some of the stories we heard might surprise you. All right, does anyone have any questions about this Maisie? This is not a research design. This is this whole thing I just showed you is an example of a single multi-component, multi-level adaptive implementation strategy. The reason it's adaptive is because I'm providing different strategies over time depending on the needs of the schools. And in this case, I'm adapting to the needs of the schools. Let me pause there for 10 seconds just to make sure I catch one of your questions. Any questions on this? No, you guys are good? Well, I did have a question. I've just typing too slowly. Um, so uh, you, you're talking about coaches and, and facilitators, and I've been part of and seen very long and quote unquote deep discussions about what's a facilitator and what's a coach. And I'm wondering in implementation science is that standard language in quality improvement, improvement science, we have improvement advisors who are basically improvement scientists usually. And we have improvement coaches and we know exactly what they do. They coach teams. Yeah. So is this a different construct? Do you have a, your own jargon? Help me out. Well, I'm a statistician, right? So um, I'm going to try to keep my jargon on other things. But but the domain scientists I'm working with, Don, thank you for that question. Coaching here is very specific. It's CBT skills coaching. OK, so I probably could have written that out and it would have been a lot more clear. So this is somebody with a degree in clinical psychology, an expert CBT person, if you will, who is delivering and trying to open the head of the school professional and stick in the skills to do CBT properly, effectively, and in their work environment, okay? Whereas the facilitator is a totally different human. They might have a master's degree. They're more skilled in strategy. They're more skilled in more, sort of Think of an MBA type and their goal, you can call them a coach. I don't actually care what we call them, but their goal was to help address 
non-skill-based barriers. That is, let me say that again, non-CBT skill-based barriers. Okay, Don? So that's how that's how it was conceptualized in this particular Maisie for what it's worth. I yeah. hope that helps, Don. Yeah, uh, th that makes sense. I mean, in general, when quality improvers put together uh, a, I'll call it implementation team, uh, there is a content expert who does exactly what you're saying. Are they calculating the functional status score of rheumatic disease correctly? There's an improvement advisor or scientist, and then there's somebody who is coaching the teams on how to do improvement. And That's it right. sounds like you just have different way of talking about it, but it's basically similar. It's pretty similar. I would agree. Yeah. That's great. Thanks, Don. I appreciate it. Okay. So let's move on to, I'm going to skip example two. There's no time. So, um, cause I'm trying to stick to Natisha's 440, stop by 440. So, um, why Maisie? So this is, this is my first attempt at helping you with the significance section of your grant. So, um, timing is important. The speed of adoption varies across clinics, across clinicians, across systems. That's pretty obvious, but we rarely see adaptive uh, implementation strategies that are actually taking that into account. Uh, strategic sequencing, you might need to lay the foundation using one implementation strategy so that you can come in later, should you need to come in later with a different strategy, okay? And vice versa, right? And of course, health equity, uh, Maisie's are consistent with what's called vertical health equity principles because I'm not coming out of the gates giving all schools all of the implementation strategies, right? I'm, I'm withholding coaching until I think it's necessary. I'm withholding facilitation until I think it's necessary, right? Otherwise, um, in a world of limited resources, I may not be able to address the needs of all the targets, right? And then finally, three more, engagement is critical. I would say engagement is one of the things that implementation science is just now coming to grips with and has been swept under the rug. Uh, an implementation strategy is no good <laughs> if the school professional or the school you're working with is not engaged in it, right? That's like saying, I'm going to do a webinar, but no one shows up to the webinar, right? So uh, that's often swept under the rug, um, but it's impossible to sweep under the rug, I think. Uh, the other one that's critical is, and this is so interesting, I'm about to show you results of a study where this is obvious, more is not better. If there's one thing I've learned in my career is that more almost always backfires. <laughs> and then you have the resource efficiency. So this would be sort of from the health econ point of view, um, you know, just in terms of dollars, uh, you might have to sort of hold off and step up for targets that need it. Or you might think the other way. You might have to step down for the targets that are doing well. So uh, Maisie's can help you do either one of those. Okay, and you might be doing both. All right, this is great. I have exactly 14 minutes to get through the last part of my talk. So this is not terrible, okay? And um, now I'm shifting gears and I'm gonna ask all of you to put your researcher hats back on. And this is the part where I'm gonna be talking about smarts. And the reason smarts are in this section where, where you have your researcher hats on is that up, up until now, Maisie's has nothing to do with the researcher except that we might want to be creating really good Maisie's as researchers, which is what I'm gonna get to, okay? But the Maisie's are for the use of the implementation support professionals. I'm now gonna talk about a specific kind of randomized trial that you might use, you the researcher, to answer interesting questions to get a really good Maisie. All right, Natish, does that make sense? So let's do it. But let's do a little quiz first. So that little Maisie I showed you earlier, what kind of randomized trial would you use to evaluate the Maisie I just presented? So let's just pretend that your goal is just to evaluate the Maisie I just showed you. What kind of trial would you use does anyone want to give it a try? Give it the answer a try. <laughs> anyone? No? Don? Effectiveness uh, implementation hybrid design. 
Yeah, a hybrid design. Yeah, you would do that. And 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 actually, since we're interested in evaluating, it might be as simple as a two-arm RCT, right? Like you take a hundred schools, 50 of them get the Maisie we just talked about, and the other 50 get some suitable usual care, right? I mean, that's just an example, right? So this is a traditional two-arm. And then if you did this study, you would confirm or not, <laughs> or not, that this Maisie is more effective than, okay? The reason I did this pop quiz is this is not what I'm going to talk about for my remaining 12 minutes. All right, you guys? So I did this pop quiz so that you can get this trial design out of your heads because I am not talking about evaluating Maisie's for the remainder of this talk. I'm talking about creating really good ones. So I just need you to realize that, that the trial designs I'm about to show you are all for you, the researchers in the room who want to create an optimized Maisie so that in the future, should they want to do a two-arm RCT, they actually see an effect. <laughs> okay, because as all of you know, uh, the majority of trials that are confirming an intervention, implementation strategy or interventions, rarely ever show that it it confirm that it works. Okay, so this is just me saying evaluation and optimization are wildly different things and do not confuse them. All right, so let's do it. So this is what I call the top four. Okay, I got 11 minutes. So, you know, just like we have the final four in basketball, we have the basic four. The basic four, so you might be interested in the effectiveness of earlier strategies or the effectiveness of later strategies, right? Like, hey, Danny, Coaching was pretty expensive. What and the, so this is a this column is an example. This is the question type, right? So you want to evaluate in the context of this Maisie, what's the effectiveness of coaching, right? Or among the slow responding schools, do I really need to do facilitation? What's the effectiveness of it, right? And then question type three, which is fascinating. Some of you in the room might be interested in G. I design coaching and facilitation to work synergistically together, but do they, you know, because ideally what you want is one plus one equals five, right? You want coaching and facilitation when they're on, you want them to be synergistic, not antagonistic, right? And it does happen sometimes, y'all, that I do two components and they backfire, that can happen. So some of you might be interested in interaction effects. And then yet others of you on this call might be like, Danny, this whole mazy thing, this whole adaptive thing, way too complicated. So some of you might be interested in, do I do a mazy or do I do something simpler? Like, Danny, just give them rep. Or Danny, just give them coaching. Don't monitor, don't adapt. You guys with me? So I call these the basic four. And what I want to show you is I want to show you one trial that I designed. It's, it's a while back now, which was the trial that was motivated by the Maisie I showed you earlier. So now I'm not showing you a Maisie. Now I'm showing you a clustered SMART. The reason it's clustered is because I did randomize schools. So for example, in this study at week 12, I randomized all of the schools to whether or not they got coaching. And at week 21, I randomized all the slower responding schools to whether or not they got facilitation. In this study, if you were a responding school, you just continue with whatever you got. So if you didn't get coaching, you just continue with rep. If you did get coaching, you just continue with rep and coaching. Everybody with me? Yeah? Okay. This is called a clustered smart because my randomizations are at the school profession at the school level, but my outcome is the amount of CBT being delivered by the school professionals within the school. And as all of you guys know, or as I told you earlier, there's anywhere between one and four, usually about two or three school professionals at each school in the state of Michigan. So that's why it's clustered. If my primary outcome was at the school level, it wouldn't be clustered, right? Everybody with me? And this study actually was with, a, with about 100 schools, and I think it ended up being 194 school professionals. So like on average, two school professionals, okay? 
Is everybody with me? So this is the first time today that you guys see a trial design, something a researcher does. And the reason you're doing this is because you're interested in answering those basic four questions and others that I'm about to show you in a minute. But before I go to the other questions, why don't I show you some results just to get you excited, okay? And before I show you the results, I'm gonna do one more thing. I want you to realize, everybody chime in now, because if you've been falling asleep, I really need you to wake up for the next two minutes, okay? All right, so inside of this study design, there are actually four implementation strategies. Let me walk you through them before I show you the results. There are some schools that all they ever got was rep, okay? It's not even adaptive. So imagine a school that got rep upstart. Imagine a school that did not get coaching while well, they got rep. They st they're still getting rep. And then imagine a school that was responding while well, they just continued on rep. And imagine a school that was slow responding and did not get facilitation. Well, there you have it. So one of the strategies is just rep, not adaptive. There's another adapt non-adaptive strategy here, which is the schools that got rep and coaching and nothing more. So watch, you got rep, you got randomized to coaching. If you were responding, you continued coaching and rep. If you were not responding, you didn't get facilitation. So you continued getting coaching and rep. So, so far I've shared with you two interventions, two implementation strategies that are not adaptive. But then there's two others that are adaptive. I don't get coaching, I'm slow responding, I get facilitation, I'm responding, I, I keep with rep, that's one adaptive. And then the final one is the one I showed you earlier. I start with rep, I get coaching, I'm not responding, I add facilitation, I am responding, I stay with coaching. Everybody with me? So inside of this- Actually, study, I, actually I, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to follow this in my it, pictorially in my head. Yeah. Is this basically a X armed factorial design? This is a fact. All all smarts, Don, every single smart known to mankind is a factorial design. This is nothing more than a factorial design taking place in time. So okay. anytime you read Can we just call smart, it that then? I mean, if I'm if I'm more comfortable with that rather than Oh, yeah. You, it doesn't whatever. matter to me what you call it. Yeah. Level. <laughs> yeah, you can call it a sequential factorial design. Okay. That's fine. That's what it Thank is. You. That's all it is. Yeah. Yeah, that's all it is. All right. Let's run. There's a movie call. called When Worlds Collide. <laughs> yeah. 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 I like that you're saying that because it means that like I'm getting across to you, which is really important. Well, I'm me. listening. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. Yeah. You're not sleeping. Okay. You guys ready? So on the left in circles, I'm going to show you a blue and a green circle. Those are the non-adaptive interventions. Okay, Don, in this factorial design. And in triangles are the two adaptive interventions or adaptive implementation strategies. Everybody with me? <laughs> the y-axis was our primary outcome, which was the amount of CBT being delivered on average by the school professionals at the school. And the x-axis is time. All right, here are the results. The most fascinating part of this study, let's start down here, is that um, rep plus coaching, the non-adaptive rep plus coaching, was the least favorable of the four strat of the four interventions, the four strategies. That was much to the surprise of my colleagues, because that's complete opposite of the hypothesis. In fact, you should know that we powered the study to detect these two things right in the middle. We done, we powered the study to compare the Cadillac adaptive implementation, that is the rep coaching facilitation, to the rep alone, right? The least intense one thinking, oh my God, of course we're gonna power for that one. That one's gonna, there's gonna be a massive effect. Well, guess what? Uh, there was no difference between those two. The costliest, most intensive, and the least costly is least intensive, there was absolutely no difference. But however, however, the best, the most favorable of the four was the rep plus facilitation adaptive intervention up here. And in some ways, one way to interpret this graph is that by week 21, 
which was um, about, you know, 10 weeks or so into coaching, coaching was already falling behind and there was nothing facilitation could do to make up that deficit. So even if facilitation was added here and you, you climbed up a little, you couldn't make up the deficit. Okay. So that's one way to think about it. Okay. All right. So these are fascinating results because first of all, we are, remember how I said more is not always better? Well, you're seeing this here, right? I mean, you're seeing it as bright as can be, right? <laughs> so that's one thing that was interesting. Uh, the other thing that I found uh, fascinating was, um, you know, we have to be thoughtful about the use of the expensive interventions. And now this study does not say you should not do coaching. Some of you might find that counterintuitive to this graph. This graph is just the primary aim. And this is where I wanna to end today's talk. I wanna to end today's talk by explaining that, um, that smarts are about doing more than just the basic four. So for example, a lot of what you're gonna do in a smart is trying to figure out how to more deeply tailor the adaptive implementation strategy. So for example, you might be asking, well, maybe only the startup schools require coaching. Well, that analysis I just showed you wasn't about that question. The, the answer to that question, question six, it's coming in some subsequent papers and I think you'll find them quite interesting. All right, so this is the goal of SMARTS, guys. The goal of SMARTS, the goal of an optimizing scientist, the way we're framing it, is that the, the express purpose of the trial is to actually put together the intervention. And so we have a host of other questions about how to make that maze even better. It's okay that my primary aim was this one, right? It's the aim I wanna provide the most assurances about. It's the aim I wanna have the lowest type one error and so on and so forth, right? It's the aim I have the power for, but all of the secondary aims are gonna be supporting aims that when you're done analyzing them, the goal is to walk away with even a better Maisie than either one of the two down here. Does everybody understand that? That's, that's the intuition behind optimization trials, okay? That's the goal. And when you're doing some of those other aims, you're happy to tolerate a slightly higher type one error, you know? You, you might tolerate a 10% or a 15% alpha because the goal is to pick up the signals that, that are suggesting to you in the data, hey, coaching actually is gonna be very useful for startup schools, you know, and so on and so forth. So that when you get to the confirmatory trial, you now are proposing an intervention that has a strong effect. My time is officially up, but all of you guys are gonna get copies of this, of this slide deck. And you will see as you're walking through the slide deck, a host of other questions, including questions that are top of mind for me, which are fascinating, Don and Natish, which have to do with sort of, okay, Danny, this is great, but you only focused on one level. What about randomizing at multiple levels? Well, that's the future. So I'm actually working on the statistical methods right now that would enable any one of y'all to actually understand how to randomize at multiple levels. And we really get into some fascinating questions about spillover, you know, because part of what you want to do in these trials is you want to um, have positive spillover, right? If I'm only touching some of the clinicians at the clinic, how do I intervene on those clinicians so that they intervene in a positive way on the other clinicians, right? And so on and so forth. Thank you all for your time today. Thank you. Awesome. Danny, thank you. Thank you. All right, we have a good amount of time for questions. I'm going to take the uh, prerogative. Oh, you had a little scrape. I'm sorry. Uh, all right, we might we might mute uh, one of our speakers. Uh, but the uh, I'm going to take the prerogative of asking two questions. So one is relatively technical uh, for the audience that is less familiar with your work, but I'll, and then the second one is about inference. Um, and so you know the paradigm that you presented reminds me of how you and Billy and Susan talk about the relationship between JEDIs and micro-randomized trials, just-in-time yeah. adaptive trials, that one is a design, one's an intervention and one's a design 
to optimize that intervention. Um, and this is sort of analogous to that. A Maisie is a intervention and then and a smart is a way to optimize uh, that. And um, and when in you sort of put out this idea that there's really two goals, one is optimization and one is evaluation. And so my first question for you is that, you know, these can sometimes be accomplished at the same time and or can they be? And so, for example, methods like reinforcement learning may allow you to optimize and to evaluate at the same time, potentially. Depends how you can sort of conceive of them. And so I'm, I'm wondering if these two odds, these two things are in fact at odds because the academics, of, uh, you know, all of us say, well, if I first have to design it and then I have to optimize it and then I have to evaluate it, that's like a lifetime's work uh, and getting it funded and supported and all the rest of that is can be difficult. Yeah. And so my first question for you is that one. How would you, how should we think about these as distinct are they do they need to be distinct do they need to be phased yeah oh my god there's like four questions in one let me see where i start so yes if, if any of you go to my website d3 center you'll notice that you know we're all statisticians over here right and and quants so you'll see that we are now developing different kinds of interventions so you got adaptive interventions which is our older work you got mazes you got jedis and for any, and then there's others too, right? And for any one of those interventions, we are all developing optimization trial designs, right? Yes. So the answer is yes, Natish. Okay. And we actually, we are actually, and I'm writing a paper about this now. We need, we need y'all to always, to really think carefully about the, whatever project you're doing. We first want you to think about what is its intervention design? We think you must do that. We do. Second, we need you to think about what are your questions? Are they optimization questions? Are they evaluation questions? And third, you then reach for the appropriate design. Notice how the appropriate research design comes last. Unfortunately, because in the olden days, all we had was the RCT, people are accustomed to trying to fit their questions into an RCT, but that is not the future. So that's my answer to that first question. All right, we are in the future now using these ideas. Awesome. Okay, All right. your second question was about reinforcement learning. All I wanna say about that is, are you talking about reinforcement learning that the intervention is doing? Or are you talking about reinforcement learning that the researcher is doing in their data analysis? Those are actually different. Okay, so we gotta get that straight. Um, and hopefully that helps you out, Natisha, a little bit. I, I'll stop there to make you room for other questions. Great. Great. Okay, I'm gonna ask one more, and then I'm gonna encourage others to sort of bring their questions, and and we'll we'll try and raise hands if there's lots of them. Okay. Um, so the second one is about inference, and so in your primary aim of the trial, this uh, that you showed us, the Maisie yeah. that you showed us in the trial, um, you showed us sort of four lines uh, because it's you know, and Don's question was a very good one that it, it's factorial. So how you analyze factorial trials is different than how you analyze regular parallel group randomized control trials. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could give us just a little bit of intuition uh, for the non-statisticians about how we should think about analysis or inference when we have a design like that. I see. I see. Are you referring to like, act, like what are the actual comparisons that are being- Yeah, made? exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. So what am I comparing yeah. to what? And what what do I draw out of that? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, that is a hard question for me to answer without having some of my other slides handy, you know? Perfect. But But, but uh, I love the question. And so if we go back to this, um, the bottom line, Natish, is a lot of the analyses that you use in, in optimization trials, actually, let me use Don's language. All of the analyses you use in any factorial design, because the majority of optimization trials are factorial design, um, they, they always end up using and reusing multiple cells. Mm -hmm. That becomes a very important characteristic, and that might be all I'll say, but for example, in this study, you know how we had some slow, some responding schools that uh, continued and then, right? And, and actually responding schools that continued, they are actually consistent with more than one of the interventions I showed you on that picture. Uh, you know what I mean? So like, if you think about it, watch this, you guys are gonna love this. 
like in the inside of this blue line right here are the schools that are responding despite not having gotten coaching. Well, those very same schools, those very same schools are part of, of, um, of the rep circle down here. You know, they're part of this blue circle. So a lot of what happens in a factorial design is you kind of draw strength across the different cells. Natish, I'll stop there, which is shy of giving a full kind of tutorial on how you analyze factorial designs. So, so you're modeling the factors though, right? As opposed to the arms is the is the basic yeah. approach. You're modeling factors as opposed to arms. You could model cells, but that's not the power of a factorial design. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Questions from others. Nancy, I see your hand, please. Yeah. Thanks so much. And thank you, Danny. I had the pleasure of hearing a similar version of this talk, I think two years ago at the Braybill conference. And I feel like I sort of understand it now. Um, so I appreciate <laughs> hearing it again. <laughs> Um, my question is about um, in your example uh, where, you know, it looked like one pathway was better at increasing the total amount of time spent in CBT compared to other ones. And that was an unexpected finding. It got me thinking about, you know, what if um, the coaching actually makes the providers way more efficient at providing CBT? So what if their CBT takes less time, but it's way better? Not saying that's what's happening here, but it made me wonder about what if, the outcome that you're most interested in is different for your different parts of your like study design and how you handle that. Oh, hundred percent. Your question is very insightful. So the primary outcome was CBT delivery, not CBT quality, or some people call it fidelity. Now I need you to realize this is not like a clinic where, you know, people might already be using the method and, not, and the goal is to improve quality. That is not the case in this particular design, Nancy. L look at where all the schools start. Remember when I said one of the most baffling things in Michigan is they are not using anything evidence-based. So that was the motivation for quantity being the primary outcome. But Nancy, you are right. You are correct. Once you have a clinician or a school professional doing something, and only then, by the way, I believe, <laughs> uh, I could be, maybe we can, maybe we can argue about that. But typically, once you have them doing something, you can then think about making the primary outcome something different, like quality, right? And there's always the tension between quantity and quality. I'm not pretending, I'm not sweeping that under the rug. It just, and we do have other results that I didn't show you here on quality, Nancy. So it's not like we're trying to put a veil over your head or anything like that. We The papers are out. But this was the primary outcome because in the state of Michigan, we're starting at zero. <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, you can't even talk about like quali quality without doing it. So, and actually a lot of the design a lot of the design focused on that, you know. Um, notice that we did coaching before facilitation. That's another question I often get, Nancy, which is like, well, maybe you should have done it in the reverse. <laughs> but the thing is, facilitation focuses on barriers while you had already started trying to do CBT. What we needed to do was put the CBT into their hands. And that argued for needing to do coaching and for not doing facilitation and coaching at the same time or vice versa, co facilitation then coaching. So there was a lot of thought, you know, this wasn't willy nilly, like we didn't write the grant and like in two weeks, a lot of thought went into the design of the trial, given where we were at the time the, design, the trial was designed. Nancy, does this help you a little bit? Definitely, yes. And I guess just one additional question is, will you always have the same outcome throughout the SMART trial, or could you have different outcomes at different oh. randomization points of your SMART trial? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, I see. Like, 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 I think what you're saying is like, um, here, I think what you're saying is like, could I have an outcome here that is about this randomization and a different outcome there that's about this mm -hmm. randomization? Well, here's why that's, I don't recommend that. Here's why, Nancy. Power. No, no, it has nothing to do with power. It has to do with the science. So the reason I don't recommend okay. that is because then you're effectively treating this these as two separate studies. Mm -hmm. Now, now it might be true that 
this randomization has a proximal outcome that is different from this randomization. Like, for example, that is the case here. Like coaching is actually targeting skills and facilitations targeting business barriers. But at the end of the day, whether it's skills or business barriers, we're targeting those because the ultimate goal is quantity and quality of CBT delivery. So, so the outcome should be something that the whole intervention taken as a whole is being optimized for. Do you know what I mean? Rather Got than it. A, a SMART is not a crossover study. A SMART is not two studies in one. No, no, no. A SMART is one trial. Like mm -hmm. I remember in the early days, uh, Nancy, people wanted to consent here and then reconsent there. <gasps> Gasp. Never, <laughs> never. These are not two studies. You do consent one time at the beginning. These are two randomizations at two decision points, but it's one study. I'll stop there. Yeah. Perfect. All right, Steve. Yeah, this is a great study. I've, I've been a real fan of it once it was seeing it when it was originally published and just really a great contribution to the methodological literature by the team at Michigan. Um, I, I had a couple of, one comment and one question. Uh, the comment is that clearly, you know, in this issue of how we identify core components of a multi-component intervention that are actually essential uh, this sort of design or fact, uh, any other factorial design, it, it probably does it better than anything. You know, we make our guesses as researchers as to what are, what are core and what are immutable and what are, what are adaptable. Um, you know, what's the function, what's the form to quote Brian Mittman, but you know, we, we guess and we don't know. And th that, this study was a great example where you didn't know and you had a guess and it, it was off, you know, in the hypothesis. And that's really a great lesson to all of us. Yes. I guess I had a couple of questions and follow up. One is, um, you know, this first of all assumes that the um, that the interventions that sequentially roll out that they are what they are. That the people in the field haven't kind of engaged in adaptation, and I'm wondering if there's any real time capacity in in an adaptive trial to actually have adaptation in the trial. It's messy. I'm, I'm as a biostatistician, you probably say, don't do it. Uh, too messy. No good. Not bad idea. But it is the case that you know we've observed and documented that adaptations. Uh, you can try to pre proscribe them initially, define them initially, like you have in the sequential design. But they will happen. And, and so I guess what I'm one question is, how do we think about or incorporate? And is it possible? to measure and somehow think about the ways that these adaptive trials adapt midstream, even though you don't want them to. Is there any way to, to deal with that? Yeah. And then the other thing that I always wonder about for these trials when we pre-prescribe flipping coins is where patient choice and preference sits. People, when you when when people have clinical encounters, the, the physician says, "Well, I don't know. We'll, we'll flip the coin. You know, you have no say. You're going to get what you get." She's like, "Well, we have two choices. What do you prefer? What's more in line with what's important for you? Is it is it CBT uh, and uh, lots of homework, or is it the pill? And when when people have done that in the past, people choose the pill when they find out there's lots of homework, even though it has side. Anyway, I could go on, but." What do you think about these issues about adaptation and then how we do or do not incorporate uh, participant or patient preference into these trials as a, either a covariate or as a choice-based you know, kind of uh, method, which uh, I've played with in the past and was told never to do again uh, by my statistician for all the reasons we expect. But anyways, what do you think? All right, Steve, I think you and I need about an hour. Because I'm sorry to guess a complicated okay. question. Those are loaded and I have three minutes. So let me try the first one first. Yeah. Um, the first one was about the issue of, um, of uh, you know, adaptations. Well, I guess both of them are in some ways. on. Yeah. The so we need to be really careful in implementation science. You know, it's such a budding field and people are going 100 miles an hour. There's a lot of ambitious people in this field. We need to be really careful. Um, I just wrote a paper with Amy Kilborn where I created a little table for it. 
on eight different definitions of the word adaptation, eight different ways it's being used in the literature. Oh yeah. I didn't do much else on that paper because uh, <laughs> Amy really needed to move fast, but it, it's, it's out there somewhere. It's one of her recent papers. And I need you to realize that the word adaptation is fully loaded in the sense that you say that word and everyone in the room is gonna have a different thing in their head. Let me just say one thing about the version I think you're talking about. The version I think you're talking about, and let's focus on the um, on the implementation strategy itself being adapted over the course of the trial. What that means, let me be precise, what that means is over the course of the trial, coaching is gonna change in how it's being done. Or over the course of the trial, facilitation is gonna be in change. And I am sorry to say that I am one of those people that thinks that's a very bad idea. Uh, that particular use. Why do I say that? Well, because then what what is it that we just evaluated? You know, I understand. Uh, I'm not saying it's a good idea. I'm saying it happens whether you like it or not. Uh, well, well, I think the reason it's happening yeah. is because people are too quick to want to jump to the trial. But really, yeah. when when you're doing a study that is R01 level, you should already have in your bag exactly what the intervention is and already have feasibility and acceptability data. Technically, this is no different than my answer in a confirmatory trial. You should not adapt the intervention you're testing unless, unless the actual adaptation process is the intervention itself. Like for example, when you're Fair looking enough. at reinforcement learning and artificial intelligence algorithms, and you hit go, that that thing is as adapting as it goes, but the code is staying put. It's it, it likens to that. The intervention is staying put. And that's more like the adaptation that I presented today. Amazie is written down and it's staying put. It will deliver different things at different time points, but I'm not messing with it. And so let me stop there because we really don't have much. Fair enough. I know we're out of time. Sorry to throw the bomb, you know. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Well, uh, <laughs> Danny, we've made it to five o'clock. Thank you all uh, for joining us. Dan Danny, you did not disappoint, both energetic and uh, fascinating. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here. And we look forward to seeing you in person at the next one. Um, and again, uh, thanks to everyone. Everyone have a good day. Don, send me your question. Bye, everybody.